Greetings. I am Walt Bauer, and I'd like to welcome you to the Human Development Institute's first spring seminar. I am a white male wearing glasses with a blue and white collared shirt. My pronouns are he, him, his. We welcome all the participants who are joining us today. Our presenter will provide an opportunity for questions today, and we welcome questions from all of our participants. Please type your questions for our speaker in the Q&A box for a robust question and answer session. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see the Q&A option. Please use the chat box for technical questions. You are joining the webinar on mute. There is not a participant video in the webinar room. We have live captioning for the webinar in the closed captioning feature. Turn on the captioning by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and then clicking show subtitle. Should you have any questions about CEUs, you can contact me. My email address is Walt dot bauer at uky.edu again that was walt dot bauer at uky.edu please take a moment at the conclusion of the webinar to complete our brief evaluation the evaluation will be sent to your email address after the webinar it is really helpful as we plan for upcoming webinars the title of today's webinar is The Intersection of Disability and Substance Use Disorder, Implications of the COVID-19 Pandemic. It is a pleasure and a privilege to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Michael Leslie is an associate professor in the Rehabilitation Counseling Program at Kent State University a nationally certified rehabilitation counselor and licensed professional counselor in Ohio. He has served as a counselor in clinical and vocational rehabilitation settings where he provided services to adults and adolescents in inpatient, outpatient, and community settings, including providing counseling for individuals diagnosed with a variety of substance use and psychiatric disorders. I'm now gonna turn it over to Dr. Leslie. Thank you so much, Walt. I, I think I'm going to bring up the screen share here. Um, sure. <laughs> we, we can see it, Dr. Leslie. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Perfect. Welcome, everyone. I uh, hope that you're having a, a wonderful Friday. Uh, it's a little bit chilly up here where I'm coming to you from uh, in Ohio. Uh, as Walt uh, so graciously mentioned, my name is Michael Leslie. Uh, I'm a white male. Um, I'm uh, my backdrop here is as a white wall in my home office. I'm currently wearing a uh, blue uh, collared button-up shirt, uh, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. Uh, so welcome. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your Friday to attend with us. We're excited to to bring you this webinar uh, and share some of this really critical information with you about what's been going on because there's so much uh, complexity here uh, with maybe really three different things kind of happening at once and building off of one another. So um, I'm excited to, to start unpacking some of this and bringing to you some of the research that we've been doing and um, hopefully answer some questions as they come through. So our learning objectives for today is, as you might have noted in, in the lead up um, in some of the, the uh, email correspondence that you got ahead of time. Um, the first, we're gonna discuss the current substance use disorder crisis in the United States and ways in which it directly impacts the American disability community, uh, specifically talking about comorbidity between disability, disabling conditions, and um, substance use disorder, substance use. We can identify risk factors and barriers to inclusion in education, employment, and treatment living with substance use disorders. We're going to examine the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on substance use issues, specifically for individuals with disabilities. Um, we've seen this term many times a double pandemic um, because of the, again, co-occurring issues and um, kind of the confluence of both of these things occurring at the same time. 
And lastly, we're gonna identify treatment and service delivery needs <clears throat> for individuals who are living with substance use disorder in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, for many of you that work in the field that maybe are service professionals, uh, obviously some things have changed uh, and, and we need to find ways to continue to reach those in need, particularly those uh, who are at high risk for COVID-19, high risk for severe illness, uh, and definitely need continuing treatment or continuity of treatment through um, what has been a very difficult time um, as, as far as treatment continuity goes. So let's start off by talking a little bit about what is going on in the U.S. with substance use. I'm sure that you've all heard some of the statistics and the numbers that have been thrown around and discussed. Um, so <clears throat> maybe we can get into specifics and talk a little bit about uh, what these numbers are showing us. So first of all, <clears throat> the most recent data we have is from SAMHSA, uh, the National Survey on Drug Use. And it has indicated that somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 million uh, Americans age 12 and older uh, have substance use disorders. That's 14.5% of the population. So almost 15% of the population uh, would meet the criteria and DSM-5 for substance use disorder. Uh, I know that that's, that's a pretty uh, substantial number. <clears throat> um, and what's interesting, and, and I have this bullet here at the end of the slide, is that's almost double what we saw in 2019. Uh, and and a, lot of, a lot of us might be very alarmed to hear that. Uh, however, there is the caveat that SAMHSA shifted their survey criteria this year where up through 2019, they were using DSM-4-TR criteria to determine substance use in these surveys, and they shifted to using DSM-5, and they think that that accounts for some of the increase, um, but we really went from around 20 million individuals with SUD to around 40 million as a basis of the survey, which is, um, again, very substantial increase. And so you wonder how much of that is the survey change and how much of that is what's going on with the pandemic. Um, so right away, some alarming statistics that get our attention. <clears throat> 28.3 million of those 40 million um, reported having an alcohol use disorder. Uh, and 18.4 million, almost 20 million, have a drug use disorder, uh, which is any substance, not alcohol. So these are mostly illicit substances. Meanwhile, 6.5 million reported they experienced both an alcohol and a drug use disorder comorbidly. Uh, and so they had at least one drug use disorder in addition to an alcohol use disorder. The most frequently abused illicit drugs reported in these surveys uh, where cannabis is overwhelmingly the, 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 um, the most frequently used illicit drug. I think five and six people that reported using illicit drugs reported using cannabis. Uh, opioids is next, and then stimulants um, such as methamphetamines and, and cocaine uh, round out the most frequently abused illicit drugs. So again, <clears throat> What is the national impact? So when I say we're in a substance use disorder crisis, um, those numbers are alarming. 15% of the population meet the criteria for SUD. Uh, what else might get our attention about the statistics from um, most recent years? Well, uh, around 95,000 Americans die uh, from alcohol use each year. Uh, and so that's, a, that's an extremely alarming statistic as it's the third leading cause of preventable death in the United States. Alcohol contributes to about just under 20% of emergency room visits, and it contributes about a little over 20% of overdose deaths related to prescription opioids. Uh, so if someone overdoses on prescription opioids, in about one in five cases, there was alcohol present in their system when it happened, so it contributed to the overdose death. Unfortunately, um, for the first time in recorded history, in any given calendar year, uh, so from any point to the 12 month point after that, uh, we noted um, over 100,000 overdose deaths in the United States. Now, this is very disconcerting because we started in the late uh, 2010s to see the trend of overdose deaths start to uh, go the other direction. It started to reduce. And now we're seeing a drastic increase 
um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and other factors that, that are all kind of happening at the same time. <clears throat> so in 2020, we saw a 28.5% in, uh, increase from 2019 in overdose deaths. And while normally about seven in 10 were attributable to opioids, even more so uh, this past year as around three quarters of overdose deaths were attributable to opioids. Now there's a lot to unpack there with availability of certain substances, um, specifically uh, those who might use painkillers or might've been uh, their drug of choice might've be heroin. Um, with the availability of IMF or illicitly manufactured fentanyl, which we'll get into. Um, but we think that that might be part of the issue. Uh, it's, it's not even necessarily that drug use is happening more frequently, which we think it is, but it's, it seems that people that are using substances are dying more frequently from their substance use. Uh, and so th there's just a really complex set of variables that are at, that are at play here. Interestingly enough, um, deaths due to stimulants are also on the rise. Uh, since 2012, deaths due to cocaine overdose have been on the rise, and deaths due to stimulants such as methamphetamine have continued to be on the rise the last several years as well. Um, and so it's not just opioid overdoses that we're concerned about. Um, we are also thinking about the impact of stimulant use and um, the increase in stimulant use over recent years. From an economic standpoint, um, we, we've kind of covered here the, the human life toll, which is extremely substantial. Um, but from an economic standpoint, the annual <clears throat> costs associated with substance use disorder exceed 440 billion. That includes healthcare costs, emergency room visits, treatment, um, employment issues, right? So um, money lost from businesses, um, from employees, with substance use disorders. <clears throat> so there is a, a massive human life and economic toll <clears throat> from substance use disorders in the United States. So I wanna shift our focus here briefly <clears throat> and move from talking the umbrella of substances to talking specifically about opioids. And this is probably something you've all heard about is that we're in the middle of an opioid epidemic um, and, and specifically an opioid overdose epidemic because people are, as I mentioned, dying at extremely high rates from use of opioid. Um, so I just wanna kind of briefly touch on the history of the opioid epidemic and what it means when I say we're in the middle of an opioid epidemic. Um, <clears throat> so the misuse and addiction to opioids has, has become a serious national crisis. In fact, the US Department of Public Health has labeled this a public health crisis, uh, and the CDC has labeled this as an epidemic. And so there is, again, uh, economic and social welfare at high risk due to this public health concern. Opioids, when I say opioids, I'm referring to drugs uh, such as prescription painkillers, things like oxycotton, oxycodone. Uh, I'm referring to heroin, uh, and I'm referring to synthetic opioids such as fentanyl, or you might have heard the term IMF or illicitly manufactured fentanyl, and carfentanyl, um, which is another uh, illicit, um, uh, very, very, very um, potent form of opioids. Drug overdose <clears throat> is the leading cause of accidental death in the United States. Uh, and as I mentioned before, opioids is the most common cause of overdose. Since 1999, it's estimated that overdoses have been responsible for around 840,000 deaths in the United States. Again, I, I think when we hear all these numbers, it's easy to become very numb to the impact of that. Um, we're talking almost, I mean, we're, we're nearing a million people. And if things continue to go at the rate that we're going, we're gonna get there within a couple of years. It's estimated that between eight and 12% of people who use any type of opioid will develop an opioid use disorder. Now, <clears throat> this is sort of a common misperception about opioids that everyone that uses them automatically gets addicted. Uh, that's not necessarily true. There's plenty of people that use prescription painkillers. Now there's a high risk for addiction. Um, I would argue that 12% risk for addiction is extremely high, 
Um, but it's certainly not everyone who uses an opioid is automatically going to get addicted. However, if you think about the number of people that have access and have used prescription drugs, such as painkillers, uh, and maybe have used illicit opioids, 8 to 12% is substantial. So we're, we're talking about a large percentage of people um, who use drugs have a, or are at risk for um, becoming addicted and developing an opioid use disorder. So going back to um, a national overlook of opioid overdose death rates. Now, again, let me be very specific that opioid use and opioid death rates are not necessarily the same thing. And that's, a, that's another common mis misperception. Um, for example, <clears throat> I live in Ohio. As you see, we're in the dark red. And so the darker red colors here uh, represent states with higher uh, overdose death rates. Ohio is actually in the middle of the country. They're average for the number of opioids used. So substance use, we're average. However, um, as far as opioid death rates, we're in the top five in the country. So what's interesting is it's not always about how much opioid you're using. It's, it's what type you have access to. Uh, and, and there's other complex factors culturally that play into uh, how high the death rate is. So I just wanted to give you kind of a visual. Uh, I don't know where you are in the, in the country, but this is, this is something that's impacting the entire country. Uh, and you see the, the states in gray uh, did not have data that were included for this year. Um, so the states in gray, we, we don't have the concrete data here. Uh, however, you see many of the states are red. This is particularly um, a, a very difficult issue in the Northeast and the Midwest. Uh, and even in the Southwest and Southeast, there are some real concerns here. Uh, so <clears throat> a, lot of, um, a lot of concern nationally for what this looks like. So I, I wanna briefly talk about how we got here as far as the opioid epidemic. Um, <clears throat> so our first wave, uh, if you will, the first phase, there's three phases of the opioid epidemic that we've been through. The first wave was an increase in the number of prescription painkillers that were used in the United States. Now this is really the late 80s, early 90s. Um, I'm sure many of you maybe have seen the documentaries. There's really popular shows now. I believe it's either on Hulu or Netflix. Um, talking about the, the, the beginning of this and the marketing efforts from uh, um, pharmaceutical companies, uh, talking about the low risk benefits for drugs uh, uh, in, in the 90s. So really, um, <clears throat> we went to saying, you know, pain is something you need to live with to we have these magical pills, but if you take them, uh, they'll take your pain away and you don't have to live with pain. And there's really not a lot of risk to using these medications because there's a really low uh, chance of getting addicted. In fact, there were two giant research studies published that these pharmaceutical companies were using to tout the, the, the low risk of, of these opioid prescriptions that said the risk for addiction was as low as 1%. So it, as low as 1% of people um, that use these prescription drugs were gonna get addicted to them. Uh, and we know now, uh, from our current research, like I mentioned earlier, that that's actually between eight and 12%. Um, and, but, but for whatever reason, in these large clinical studies, uh, and, and it's, it's unclear what, where the methodology went wrong or, or if it was intentional or, or what was going on. Um, but these, there, were, there were two very large studies that were touting low risk benefits for these prescription painkillers. Um, and then we had eventually the sustained release opioids such as Oxycontin um, being released, which were very popular. Uh, in fact, Oxycontin prescriptions in 1997, there were 670,000 of them nationally. By, by 2002, there were 6.2 million. And that continued to rise up until around 2016. 2016 was our peak for opioid prescriptions in the United States, and it started to go back down after that. <clears throat> There were, there were a rise of pill mills, uh, especially in areas hit hard by poverty and unemployment. Pill mills uh, is kind of a, a, a slang or generic term referring to these doctor's offices where people could just line up and get uh, opioid prescriptions. Uh, and so there were definitely some shady practices happening. Um, this was a particularly prevalent in areas of the Ohio Valley, uh, in Appalachia, in Maine, Alabama <clears throat> uh, as well. 
these indiv- these states had uh, or areas regions had <clears throat> uh, rates of oxycontin abuse that were five to six times the national average. Uh, it was particularly prevalent in areas uh, where manufacturing and coal industries were prevalent. Um, as jobs were leaving, people who had worked these jobs their whole life uh, were dealing with joblessness and continuing to deal with physical injuries that that have come from you know, working hard with their bodies their entire career uh, in these industries. Uh, and so there was kind of a perfect storm of um, isolation, joblessness, physical pain uh, that <clears throat> led these individuals to seeking this uh, potential cure for their pain. Uh, black tar heroin, uh, at the same time, was on the rise in the San Fernando Valley of California and started spreading eastward. This is particularly prevalent on younger folks in smaller sized cities. Uh, And so there was a very, very intricate uh, distribution system happening from the West across the country uh, in in what we call black tar heroin, which is a very specific looking um, form of heroin. In the second phase, we moved from prescriptions overdosing on heroin. Uh, And so this began in around the year 2010, and it was marked by rapid increases in heroin overdose deaths. Heroin overdose deaths tripled between 2010 and 2015. Again, the the peak of opioid prescriptions, I'm sorry, I misspoke, I said 2016 was uh, 2011, when there were 206 million opioid prescriptions. So let's just go back a second. In 1997, there were 670,000. In 2002, we had 6.2 million, and we thought that was a lot. By 2011, we had 206 million opioid prescriptions. So what happened was we became aware of the issue, uh, and policy changes started to happen broadly across the country, uh, and there was a crackdown on prescription policies and pill mills, reducing access to prescription opioids. So what happens when we have all these people using prescription opioids and all all of a sudden they can't get it anymore? Do they just stop using it? Do they just stop having a a dependence on these opioids? Unfortunately not. They started to look for alternatives. And as the supply, basic supply and demand, as the supply of prescription painkillers went down, the price of them uh, on the streets went way up, right? So we're talking going from, you know, maybe $5 a pill to 25, 30, 35, even more per pill. And unfortunately, heroin was a much more affordable and effective alternative for people who had become addicted to painkillers. And it was widely available. And so again, kind of a perfect storm where people had become hooked on opioid prescriptions uh, and, and then didn't have access to the prescriptions anymore. And were looking for something to Um, keep them from getting seriously ill, from going into withdrawal, and so started relying on heroin. Um, So we saw a shift then in overdose deaths due to heroin, like I said, between 2010 and 2015. So that's phase two. Phase three is when the synthetic opioid overdose deaths came came into the, the fold, and this really began in 2013. And this was tied to significant increases in overdose deaths due to synthetic opioids, as I mentioned before, illicitly manufactured fentanyl. Now, illicitly manufactured fentanyl is far more potent than regular heroin. Um, So the chance of overdose is is much higher, especially if somebody doesn't have a high tolerance built up to it. Um, So deaths attributed to fentanyl increased nationally by 540% between 2013 and 2016. And by the time 2019 rolled around, synthetic opioids became the leading causes of opioid overdose deaths, uh, attributing uh, 70% of all drug overdose deaths. And so a lot of people might ask, well, if this is so deadly, why would people use it? Well, it, it is the most potent, right? It gives somebody the best high. And if somebody is seeking that high, uh, it is certainly the most potent way to get there. Right, um, and so for individuals that are addicted, um, and and in the the, the cycle of addiction, um, the rationality that you might have as somebody who isn't, you know, somebody living with a substance use disorder might say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why are people doing that? Um, 
And I remember, you know, one of the first years I was working in treatment, I asked that very same question. And, and, and one of my, my, my consumers looked over at me and he said, well, you really don't understand it, do you? Um, you know, if, if I know people are dying from it, I know that's the stuff that I want to be taking because it's the stuff that's going to get me the high that I feel like I need. Um, instead of just waking up and using, I'm, I'm waking up sick every day and using just to feel normal, I might actually be able to get that high back that, that I've been looking for. So, um, you know, you can see what addiction does to thinking, what addiction does to um, the way you're processing thoughts and, and the, you know, it really takes somebody out of their own mind and, and replaces it with some very, um, you know, dangerous thoughts. Um, so again, um, opioid, uh, synthetic opioids, the third phase of the opi opioid epidemic. So you might be asking, you saw the, the title <clears throat> to the presentation was um, talking specifically about substance use disorders and individuals with disabilities. And so some of you, especially those who are disability professionals, might be saying, okay, Michael, where's the link here? Uh, there's a national substance use crisis. If I'm a disability professional, why do I care? You know, what's the connection here? So that brings me to our next section, and that's talking about comorbidity of substance use disorder and disabling conditions. So if you're a mental health professional or disability professional, it's important to understand that substance use disorders are going to be far more common in the individuals that you're working with professionally. So substance use disorder is two to four times more common in uh, broadly speaking in individuals with disabilities, and I, I'm, I'm including all disabilities, both physical, psychological, neurological, developmental, <clears throat> when I, in that definition, when I say broadly speaking, individuals with disabilities. So some specific numbers, rates of substance use disorder for people with spinal cord injuries or SCIs, visual impairments, amputations, so a lot of pain uh, condition there, uh, and traumatic brain injuries range anywhere from 40 to 50%, 40 to 50%. There are around 8.9 million people with mental health disorders who also experience a substance use disorder at the same time, so comorbidly. In fact, it's been estimated that between 75 and 90% of people with substance use disorders have also been diagnosed with psychiatric disorders. The most common psychiatric disorders include social phobia, major, depression, uh, major depressive disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, for some people, it's a chicken or the egg thing, right? Um, did I have a mental health uh, issue I was dealing with and I started coping with it with substance use or with substances and that eventually led to me developing a substance use disorder? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes people that don't necessarily have mental health diagnoses or conditions will start using substances and then through the process of the isolation the stressors, the psychosocial stressors, the, the unemployment, the financial issues that come with substance use disorder, um, they might develop a mental health condition uh, due to their substance use. So it, they really have a reciprocal effect on one another and exacerbate one another pretty substantially. Other connections between substance use disorder and disability, uh, there's actually a 12 to 14% lifetime prevalence rate for individuals with developmental disabilities, which is shocking. Um, there's been a lot of, of recent research uh, in the, um, uh, the use of, of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities to even traffic substances, which is a, a very, very uh, salient concern in certain parts of the country, um, using individuals that wouldn't necessarily be looked at to um, be drug traffickers to try to uh, find better routes to get these drugs out there and, and get more people using. For IV drug users, there are really high rates of infectious diseases, uh, such as HIV and hepatitis C. Um, so again, a disabling condition that comes along with uh, substance use disorder. Uh, there's also a rising incidence nationally of neonatal absence syndrome, or NAS, uh, due to drug use and misuse during pregnancy. Um, so for those that are addicted and, and pregnant and having trouble 
um, again, uh, individuals being born um, with some of these concerns. Overdose, uh, opioid overdose is more likely uh, for people with serious uh, traumatic injuries, such as spinal cord injuries or traumatic brain injuries. So again, kind of a wide swath of reasons why comorbidity is so high uh, among the American disability community. Chronic pain. So individuals with chronic pain are more likely to experience opioid use disorder and substance use disorder broadly. Uh, we know that chronic pain conditions impact over 100 million Americans each year. A very common form of treatment for chronic pain is, are opioid prescription painkillers. Unfortunately, between 21 and 29% of people <clears throat> with chronic pain issues will misuse opioids, which again leads to a high risk of developing an opioid use disorder or a drug use disorder. We know for individuals with chronic pain, um, what we might call self-medication is very common. That might be taking painkillers. Uh, that could be benzodiazepines, such as uh, clonopin or Xanax. That could be opioids, such as 